Hello, my friend, Pastor Kurt here, and I'm with all of the Bayside Campus pastors. Come on, everyone. Give them a big round of applause for less than that sermon. Uh, four of us have put together a message that is confronting exactly what's going on in our culture. We picked this passage weeks and weeks ago, but it couldn't be more dialed for this moment. We've entitled this Coming Together in a world that is tearing us apart. And I want to drive right into the context of this. James is writing very early in the history of the church, and he's concerned about two issues, one in chapter one, one in chapter two. Issue number one is this. How do real, authentic, healthy Christian individuals behave? What does it mean to not be a hypocrite and actually be a Christian? Do you know, as a pastor, I've got the privilege to comfort a lot of people dealing with sickness, families that have sickness, individuals that have sickness. And what I've learned, whether it's heart disease or cancer, the worst type of sickness is the one that isn't diagnosed. It's the one where you keep getting weaker and weaker and weaker and no specialist, no doctor knows what's going on with you or worse yet, with your loved one, with your child. I can't tell you how many parents have come to me and said, we've had a breakthrough in our daughter's sickness. We've had a breakthrough in our dad's sickness. We met a doctor who told us what the problem is. We took a test and now we know what we're dealing with. And then they'll go on to say this, and Kurt, not only is it good news that we know what the disease is, there's a therapy available to my loved one. My friend, I'm just gonna tell you right from the beginning of James what the disease is. James says the disease is the sinful desires in our heart. That's James chapter one. The disease is sin in all of us. Now, I wanna do this. I'm gonna apply this message to me. I'm not putting your mask on for you first. I'm putting my mask on first. And I'm gonna let James calling out my sin see deeply into my soul because I want the therapy of God's truth in my life. If the diagnosis is sin, what's the therapy? There's so many things. Read chapter one. I'm gonna review this read three. He says, a calm attitude and a listening attitude. James 1.19, everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, that that's a therapy to our souls, especially in times of crisis. A commitment to character. We have a responsibility if we're gonna live authentically and healthy as Christians to stand up and reject moral filth, to be people of character. And here's the therapy I really want you to hear. A controlled tongue. If anyone considers himself religious and does not keep a tight rein on his tongue, he deceives himself and his religion is worthless. We did a thing on Wednesday called a time for listening. Go watch that. Now is the time to apply the therapy of the truth of God's word. And it couldn't be more perfect than James chapter two that we're about to study in a minute. You see, he starts with the individual. Then in two, he moves on to the church. How real, authentic, healthy churches should behave. And it's interesting, he doesn't start with the worship leader and he doesn't start with the pastor, he starts with the ushers. Real church starts with how we greet and seat people. What do I mean? Look at this passage, we're gonna read it together. My brothers and sisters, James chapter two, verse one. My brothers and sisters, believers in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ must not show favoritism. Suppose a man comes into your meeting wearing a gold ring and fine clothes and a poor man in filthy old clothes also comes in. If you show special attention to the man wearing the fine clothes and say, here's a good seat for you, but say to the poor man, you stand there or sit on the floor at my feet. Have you not discriminated among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? Listen, my dear brothers. And sisters, God has not God chosen those who are poor in the eyes of this world to be rich in faith and to inherit the kingdom he promised those who love him? Do you have dis, but you have dishonored the poor. It is, not, is it not the rich who are exploiting you? Are they not the ones who are dragging you into court? Are they not the ones who are blaspheming the noble name of whom you belong? If you really keep the royal law found in scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing right. Underline that, circle that, highlight that, verse nine. But if you show favoritism, you sin. 
and are convicted by the law as lawbreakers. For whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it. For he who said, you shall not commit adultery, also said, you shall not murder. If you do not, if you do not commit adultery, but you do commit murder, you have become a lawbreaker. Speak and act as those who are going to be judged by the law that gives freedom. Because judgment without mercy will be shown to anyone who has not been merciful. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Wow, thank you. So how, how do we come together in a world that's tearing us apart? Well, James gives us this lesson right from chapter two. He basically says we got to eliminate discrimination. About twice a year, I get to fly back to Ireland. And as I'm going on that long haul flight, I'm walking down the gangway. I'm praying one prayer the whole time. Lord, please let me be shown to a seat on the left. I don't, I want to go left. I don't want to go right. But every time I got to go right. I'm back there in coach class. I go so far back. I'm in a different time zone, people. I go so far back. But all the rich people, they go to the front. They go to first class. This is what James was saying, that in the early church, a new first class had been set up and everybody else, the poor, was being put back in coach class. And James was not happy about this. You see, we heard it in verse one, that James calls it favoritism at the beginning, but he keeps writing in verse four, he calls it discrimination because that's what it is. He calls it out in the church. It was like James was sitting in the church one day and you know what? The worship hasn't started. The preacher's not on. It's like that moment before the service. He's just chilling, but he looks at the ushers and he's maddened because the ushers take the rich people to first class and they take the poor people back to the back of the church. And he says, stop the service, everybody, because God has left the building. I don't care what your worship set is. I don't care what the preacher is going to preach today. We have missed the point. We are discriminating. So he talks about discrimination back in the early church, and it was a social economic discrimination. But what about in the U.S. today? We can't avoid the headlines and what's been going on. And in our church, we got a friend and his name is Miles McPherson. Incredible guy. He runs a church down in San Diego. He used to play uh, for an NFL team. He's an African-American guy. He's got a book and it's called The Third Option. And this is what Miles says. And it's so challenging. You see, he says this, that anybody watching today, I'm sure you wouldn't call yourself a racist. And if you do, you should fall to your knees right now and seek repentance from God. But we wouldn't call ourselves a racist. But Miles says this, you know what? That sometimes we got a bias and a bias is kept deep down inside of us. And, and this is what a bias does. A bias has a game face, but a bias is in a dark shadow we place in our hearts. And when we see a certain person or a certain ethnic background or a person from a social class, we make a judgment inside of us. Nothing comes out of our mouths, but something deep in our heart has made a judgment and we avoid that person. That's a bias, everybody. And this was what Miles said one day when I heard him. and I was deeply convicted. He said, we need to go to the dark place of our hearts where that sort of thought and bias hangs out. And we need to address the issue. Everybody watching now, are you ready to do this with me? Because unity starts with you. Unity starts with you. That's what it's about. And we need to go to that dark place. And this is what Miles said. He said, we need to go to that dark place. And whatever label that we have on that group that we have labeled wrongly, we've passed judgment on them. We need to take the label of God, strip our label off them, take the label of God. And you know what the label of God is? The label of God is neighbor. Because God calls them neighbor. They are my neighbor. They are are your neighbor. And this is what James gets to, that we need to love our neighbor. And Jason's going to tell us about that because this is the royal law. Yeah, so as James is speaking, thank you so much for that, Andrew. Uh, as James is speaking, he makes it clear that we have to eliminate discrimination. But the second thing that he teaches us is that we have to elevate the royal law. Verse eight says it like this. He says, if you keep the royal law found in scripture, Love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing right. If we're ever gonna to come together in this broken world, it will only happen 
when we elevate the royal law. Listen, there are many people in the world with opinions on how to fix the world. I mean, Republicans have a method. I'm coming on the other side. Democrats have a method. Independents have a method. Fox has a method. CNN has a method. Everybody has a method on how to fix the world. But listen, all of us would agree, no matter what side of the aisle that you're on, I don't care, I'm glad you're watching, that the problem with these methods is that they haven't brought us together as a matter of fact, they have been tearing us apart. But what would happen if instead of following the method of a political party and flawed people, that we decided to lean into the method of the flawless Messiah? James says this, he says, the method of the savior is to love your neighbor as yourself. And saying this, James is echoing the teaching of Jesus that you can find, and I encourage you to read in Luke chapter 10. And if we want to come together in this fractured world, we have to elevate the royal law. Listen, Jesus Christ is the premier example of the principles he espoused. In other words, he was exactly what he taught. There was no gap between his teaching and his living. Like, I'm not a perfect individual. There is a gap between my teaching and living. But Jesus was able to exude and live out the principles of his life. Listen, he didn't just teach on the resurrection. He was the resurrection. (laughs) Jesus didn't just teach that he was the light. He was the light. He didn't just teach the word. He showed up and he said, I am the word. And if you want to know what it means to love our neighbors, all we have to do is look at the example of Jesus. Jesus knew that we would pick and choose our neighbors based upon who we like. Listen, I got people who I like to call my neighbor. Further, Christ knew that it would uh, be people like me who would choose to believe that the people who are neighbors are the people who are in our neighborhood. But Christ's example is that the love that we have for our neighbors extends beyond our neighborhood and out into the rest of the world. How does Jesus exhibit this? Before coming to earth, where was Jesus? Where was he? We are told in scripture that he was one with the father and they resided in a heavenly realm. This was a neighborhood of righteousness, a neighborhood of perfection, a neighborhood of holiness, a neighborhood of peace. This was the ideal neighborhood. But what did Jesus do? He decided to leave his neighborhood to be a neighbor to people in a broken world. He left what was perfect to come to something that was imperfect. He left that was full of peace to come to a thing that was full of problems and stress. And if we're ever going to follow the royal law, we've got to be willing to leave some things behind. We've got to be willing to leave comfort. We've got to be willing to leave convenience. We've got to be willing to leave our own biases, our systems of oppression. We've got to be willing to leave racism and sexism and any other ism that we can think of because God has called us to something higher. We've got to elevate the royal law. The world is crumbling right before our eyes. James teaches us that we got to eliminate discrimination. We got to elevate the royal law. Love your neighbor. What do you need to leave in order to be the neighbor that God has called you to be? The world is in a mess. And we've got the answer and we've got the response. But until we put down what we've been holding on to, we will never be the example that Christ has called us to be. Mike, share with us the other part that we need to know. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. The next thing we do, the final thing, is we have to learn to embrace God's grace. We have to learn to embrace the one thing that has the ability to literally change our world and our world. I don't know about you, but I got to be honest. We were having a meeting right before this and we were talking through what's going on in our nation and we have been bombarded with images that not only tear us apart, but break my heart. Images that show one race against another, one social economic level against another, a world fighting against each other. And scripture says in John 13, 35, by this, they will know you are my disciples, that you love one another. We need to embrace God's grace. I want to tell you about an image that has been in my heart, tucked away in my heart for several months. I haven't really shared this publicly, but I believe this is the image of the church. Several months back, I was at the Adventure Campus. Shout out, come on, somebody over at Adventure, what's up? I was at Adventure Campus and I'd just gotten done preaching a message and I was out in the lobby 
before Corona, you know, so I'm high-fiving, I'm shaking hands, I'm giving hugs. And a guy comes up to me and he said, Michael, I want to tell you something, but I want to apologize for what I have to say. And I thought, well, I've preached a lot of bad sermons, so it's okay. (laughs) And then he got very somber. This fellow who I'm not going to name was probably in his mid-60s, and his head tilted down, and he said to me, before I lived in California, I lived in the South, and I was very vocal against people like you, black people. I was very adamant about my posture against your race. And that was the life that I lived. He said, then I moved here to California and I found God and I thought all of those feelings and all of that went away. I don't feel that way anymore. So I'm a new person because I found Christ and I started going to church and everything was fine until you showed up, Michael. And he looked at me and he said, you showed up one weekend and started to preach and I couldn't listen to you because all I could see was the color of your skin. And all of those feelings and emotions came back and I started feeling just exactly the same way that I used to feel. And I started to feel the pain and the hatred against a skin color. And he said, but then I would sit in the seat every single weekend that you would preach. And after several weekends, I found myself sitting in the seat. And all of a sudden, when I looked at you, I didn't see your skin color. I didn't see that you were a black person. And now tears are streaming down his face. And he said, what I saw is that I'm grateful that you are my pastor. And he said, so I want to apologize for the life that I've lived. And I want to ask if it's okay for me to give you a hug. And so in the middle of the lobby, two grown men with uh, tears streaming down our eyes, we embraced each other. We hugged each other. And right there, I felt like this is the purpose that God called me to. This is why I do what I do. And I want you to understand that that weekend, he didn't have an interaction with the preacher. That weekend, he had an encounter with his creator. And that is the exact same creator we're calling out to this weekend. Who is he? The creator that changed history. The creator that can change your heart. The creator that will change our world. I'm talking about a God that will not only say we're not supposed to be discriminated against, but he will bring us together. Why? Because scripture says, by this, by God's grace, they will know you are my disciples because you have love for one another. Not an image with a man holding down another man, but an image of two men completely different embracing one another. My question for you, have you embraced God's grace? You're here this weekend, you're watching online. Maybe you've been here for the past 12 weeks. Maybe you've been in church your entire life or maybe you just happen to click on right now and you say, Michael, I'm wrestling with some emotions. I'm feeling some type of way looking at you right now. Listen, that's okay. I love you and it's okay for you to process how you feel. But what's gonna change it is not by you thinking about it, not by you watching television, not by you listening to your political party. What's gonna change it is by embracing the grace that only comes from your creator. Have you taken the time to embrace his grace? There's two people I'm gonna pray for right now. The first person is you're a follower of Christ. You love God and you love people and you're wrestling with what's happening in your heart. Listen, embrace God's grace, bring it to him and he will soften and restore and heal the broken places in all of our lives. The second group of people, you're here and you're watching right now and you have never experienced the grace of God. You've been in church, you've been around church, you have watched church, but you haven't asked Christ into your heart. That's why you've been so hard. You've been trying to do this on your own. You've been trying to walk through the pain on your own, the hurt on your own, the void on your own, the separation on your own. But listen, God loves you and he has a plan for your life. Now listen, I'm gonna in a moment, say a prayer, and I'm gonna invite you to say this prayer with me. I'm not gonna bow my head. I'm not gonna close my eyes because I wanna have a conversation with you. In just a moment, I'm gonna give you the opportunity to embrace God's grace. 
I'm going to give you the opportunity to accept him in your heart. And scripture says three things happen when we accept Christ as our Lord and Savior. The number one thing, the first thing is that all of our sin is forgiven. That's our pain. That's our hurt. And that's our past. You are forgiven. The second thing that happens is God says you become a new creation in Christ. And the third thing that happens is when you take your final breath, like we all will, you will spend eternity in heaven with your creator, a real place called heaven. In just a moment, I'm going to pray and I'm going to invite you to accept Christ into your heart. Say this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I give you my life. Come on, say it with me. Come into my heart. Change my heart. Forgive me for my sins. I turn from my old life and I turn towards you. Make me new. Fill me with your Holy Spirit and use my life to reach others. In Jesus' name, everyone said, Listen, if you just prayed that prayer for the first time, I want you to know that you've made the best decision of your life. We would love to know about it. All you need to do is text the word NEXT to 56316 or click a button somewhere over here. It's one of these places and let us know about your decision. We love you guys and we will see you next weekend.